What is up, guys? It is the Blue Bloods coming back at y'all with our third episode of our Big 12 and 30 Days. And we're joined by what I think might be the busiest woman in sports today. <laughs> She's the host of Sooner Sports Spotlight, lead reporter for Sooner Sports TV, host all Sooner preseason and spring game coverages, play-by-play -play for men's basketball at times, and she also has a podcast just like us. I mean, Jessica Cootie is joining us today. I just want to say I appreciate you coming on here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So we got to start with last season. It was an outstanding season, I would say, for Oklahoma. Another Big 12 championship, the fourth in Lincoln Riley's you know, four years at Oklahoma. A big Cotton Bowl win over Florida. Did this season for you, though, exceed, fall short of, or meet your preseason expectations? Well, I think with everything that kind of went on leading up to the season, I don't know if you could really say or I could really say that I had expectations, um, you know, no spring ball. And from the start of kind of covering this team when they, they did finally get to come back to practice and doing interviews with coaches, the one thing that um, – you know, heard over and over again was how young that this football team was. And so that's always hard when you don't have spring and, you know, fall was interrupted a couple of different times. It wasn't very consistent. And then you, you're you relying on a bunch of freshmen and redshirt freshmen and sophomores that have not been in the fire. Um, you know, that can be a little bit of challenging. And I do think, too, um, which, you know, we talked a lot about, like, had – the schedule been how it originally was before it had changed up. Um, you know, I don't know if the the two losses happened there at the beginning. Um, you know, it's like the two worst teams that Oklahoma could have played out of the gate with just one non-conference game um, with Kansas State and Iowa State just because of, you know, how that those programs are built and uh, whatnot. And, and, you know, Kansas State at the time, you know, had their quarterback, senior guy, had been around. Um kind of knew how to play Oklahoma. And so you're talking about an old team versus a young team, second game of the season. So, um, and then going to Iowa State, again, another very veteran team. So if you look at how Oklahoma finished the season at the end and, you know, getting Ronnie Perkins back, getting Ramondre Stevenson back, I, I don't know if those outcomes are the same. So, you know, it's 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 hard, but, um, you know, with the way that everything kind of went down, I think they were very happy with how everything panned out. And, um, you know, it ended up being – yeah, another Big 12 championship winning season. And I think those young players have learned a lot and will be uh, take massive steps going into this year. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, you know, I'm a K-State graduate student now. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not a K-State fan. I see the Auburners in the background, but, you know, a lot of flack. But people forget Skylar Thompson got hurt toward the end of the season. And so that loss looked a lot worse because they lost probably some games down the stretch that they wouldn't have lost. But I want to talk about the playoff spot. There was a lot of debate about that fourth playoff spot. Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Notre Dame, all three were the, I guess, the three main teams. But Oklahoma was the only conference champion in that group. In your opinion and just kind of the tone of the fan base, did, do, does the fan base and you think that Oklahoma should have received that fourth playoff spot? Well, I just think it's hard because at at that point, like had Oklahoma had, um, again, maybe a couple other opponents in the non-conference um, that you could you could point to. Um, the, at the end of the season, were they playing some of the best football in the country? Yes, but you know they haven't put in a two-loss team yet, so I don't think necessarily. Um, I think people understood. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end, you look how they're playing. And, you know, they're playing very well. But, um, you know, I also think it was good to go to the Cotton Bowl and beat a Florida team and kind of get some momentum going into the offseason. It's, it's a really different feel going into the offseason with a loss. Not saying they would have gone to the college football playoff and lost, but I, I think for a young team to finish out on a high note, to win the Big 12 title and, you know, to beat a Florida team, whatever, you know, they want to say about who was out on the field, um, you know, that's a big win and that's a good win. And that's, it's, it's good momentum heading into an off season and a preseason when you've basically got loads of talent and kind of building off of that momentum moving forward. Right. I mean, I agree. I mean, I know Florida, you know, they're going to say they didn't have Kyle Pitts. They didn't have, I think, I don't think they had any of their top three. Had the Heisman receivers. Trophy finalists, so. E exactly. And the way Oklahoma beat them, the way they beat them, I don't know if 
you know, having three wide receivers was going to make a difference. But you mentioned youth on this team. That starts with Spencer Rattler. This was the first season he was given the keys to Lincoln Riley's offense. He's like you mentioned, he struggled at the beginning sometimes in Iowa State, K State game, didn't play his best. But toward the end of the season, he was <clears throat> arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the country. Did he live up to your expectations? <clears throat> Sorry. And what grade would you give him for your for his first year? Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing with with Spencer Rattler and Bill Biedenboe will be the first to tell you, like, the offensive line didn't play great either. So a lot of people want to put it on Spencer Rattler, but you got a young quarterback that, um, you know, is kind of, again, going – everything is new. And, and you know, I interview Lincoln Riley every week leading into game day, and, you know, a lot of people kind of wanted to – after the Texas game, oh, he's got it all figured out. But everything – and. Honestly, even going into this year, everything is going to still be new because he's going to be playing places that he's never played. So, um, you know, there's still going to be different, you know, aspects that he's going to be. He's still never been a starting quarterback in Morgantown, you know, um, things like that where, um, you know, he's never been up to Manhattan, which is a crazy atmosphere. So, you know, things like that where he still is going to be a new quarterback. But last year, especially, you know, the first time in that role, Every week was new and every challenge was new and every circumstance was new. And then you throw in, you know, they'll tell you there are a lot of times that a lot of the position groups weren't playing great. I mean, but, you know, I think the offensive line is key here because, um, you know, at the beginning, especially those first couple of games, they weren't gelling. They weren't playing as cohesively as what we're used to seeing out of, uh, you know, the Oklahoma offensive lines. And again, towards the end, they got it all figured out. But um, you know, I think that's kind of bodes for a little bit of a chaotic disaster, I guess, if you if you want to say with a new brand new freshman starting quarterback and a, being protected by a line that's not gelling as well as what we're used to. So I don't, I don't think a lot of the issues, um, you know, that Spencer had early, you can put all on him. So, um, you know, I think by the end and, and we saw. Shoot, I think most people have him as the best returning quarterback in college football, the way that he kind of ended his season. Um, I, I think it'd be hard not to, you know, put him up there in a high grade um, if you compare, if you just talk about at the end. And it, and it you can't win it with just a quarterback. So, you know, by the end, it was everybody was playing while well, the wide receivers had kind of come on a little bit, um, you know. So I, I think – all around just the way the improvement of this team, as much as people want to put it pointed at Spencer in the beginning, I think it was kind of a, a learning gelling type figure out situation for those first few games for everybody. Right. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of youth in a lot of key spots. I mean, losing CD lamb is huge as much as, you know, people want to say this or that about him. CD lamb was one of the best wide receivers in the country a year ago. And now you got to replace him, but I want to look to the defensive side of the ball. This is where I think I've seen the biggest improvement for Oklahoma. Alex Grinch has done an outstanding job building that defensive unit up. It was top 30 in the country in scoring defense this year and looked dominant. I mean, I look at that Oklahoma State game. They just absolutely were more physical, aggressive, and they dominated Oklahoma State. What has been the biggest difference you have seen in Grinch's defensive scheme? And can they take that next step to be an elite level top 10 defense? Absolutely, they can. I mean, I think they're right there on the fringe of it. And again, you look at how they were playing at the end, you know, some of those stats at the beginning kind of drug them down or they're, you know, top 10 in a lot of those statistics that they ended up just outside of. And But their goal is not to be top 10, top 20. Their goal is to be number one. And the fact that they are even believing that they have that potential, to me, is the biggest change. It's the confidence. It's the belief. It's the buy-in. Um, you know, that they're they're I've been out to practice a few times and just the swagger that they're kind of walking around with is just it's completely different, you know, and, and I talked to Nick Benito a couple of weeks ago and, um, you know, one of the leaders coming back and they want to dominate practice. They want to set the tone for practice. And that's a completely different tune than what we were hearing. You know, this has been an offensive team for the last few years. And the fact that, you know, the defense is walking in there saying, no, this is our practice to run. You know, and and whether the de the defense dominates that day or not, they're walking into practice believing that we are going to run the show today. And so, um, to me, that's number one, first and foremost, is just the belief and the confidence, and um, you know the 
Coach Grinch has talked about it's an effort-based defense. And so I think, you know, a lot of times these guys would get beat up if they give up a big play. But that's going to happen playing against these Oklahoma, these Big 12 offenses. So it's a it's a how you respond to that. And I think that's been a big key. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of allowed people to play more free and do what they do best. And, um, you know, people like to do that. So I just – I think – you know, the, the buy-in and the belief that they can be a good defense, but then he's also got it brought in some studs and been able to build some depth that we haven't seen here in quite some time. So yeah, I think they're getting there and I think they're on the fringe. And I think the expectation going into this year is we're going to be a top defense, not only in the big 12, but in the country from the start, not at the end, you know, we want to dominate from start to finish. And so I think that's kind of where, a lot of the big changes have happened within this defense. It's just even in the, in the mental and the mindset. Right. Yeah. I've, I've just been so impressed with, uh, with Grinch's job, the players he's been recruiting. I look at the, this past recruiting class, which we'll address in just a minute, but there were some studs on the defensive line being brought in. And I want to shift to the coaching staff though. You know, Lincoln Riley, we mentioned four straight big 12 titles. He's only lost eight games in four years, never lost more than two games in a season. What makes him so successful? And do you, so I know this is early. It's year four. Do you think he has a chance to become one of the all-time coaches in OU history? I mean, it's hard to say because you never know when it's so early on. Um, you know, he's, uh, you know, been locked in here. He's been rumored to go to the NFL every year, basically, since he's been here. But, you know, he's maintained that this is where he wants to be. But you never know if and when that would change, if that could change. And I think that's what they said about Bob Soups, you know, basically for so long there um, in the beginning when he was starting here, it seems like every year he was linked to going to an NFL job. So you never really know, um, you know, when that could maybe change, but if he stays here, yes, absolutely. And I think because he's, um, he evolves, right? Like, so he knows kind of how to, um, he's, he's, he's not just an offensive guy. So uh, let me go back. So when he, before he even came to Oklahoma, right, when he was at Texas Tech or East Carolina, you know, you didn't necessarily see him use the fullback or H-back position, right? And Dimitri Flowers has talked about how when that hire was made that Lincoln was going to be the offensive coordinator, he was worried that he wouldn't have a spot here. And, you know, Dimitri Flowers is arguably one of the best fullbacks to play at Oklahoma. So, um, you know, he, it's, he had a conversation with Coach Riley, and Coach Riley said, hey, the best – 11 guys are going to be on the field for me. If you're one of the best 11, you'll be on the field. So um, that and then, you know, the running backs, the the way that he was able, he, you know, it was kind of pass, pass, pass before he got here. And now it starts all, it all starts the run game. So I think, um, you know, the way he's been able to evolve and, um, you know, kind of tailor his offense to the talent that he has on the field. We've seen kind of different looks from every quarterback that, you know, he's, he's had between Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts and now Spencer Rattler. I think the way he can tweak that, but then also his commitment to make sure he's got Alex Grinch here, the defensive staff in place to, he, he realizes that, you know, to be the kind of team that, that they want to be and to win, you know, that last game at the end of the season, it can't just be about the offense. So he's ensured that, you know, he's got a staff in place to compete with bringing in and having one of the best offenses in the country. So, you know, I think he realizes all of that. I think his recruiting is second to none, the way he kind of, um, you know, it might not always be his idea all the time, but he's open to hearing it and want, and brings in the staff to help assist with that. Um, the relationships that he builds. I mean, we saw, um, you know, how quickly he was to welcome Porter Moser, the new uh, men's basketball coach. I, you know, he's, he um, he's invested in people and we hear it over and over again from his players. He's a player's coach. And I think that's kind of been key to success, successful coaches here recently is um, being a player's coach, quote unquote. And really um, those guys, those players want to go to battle with him and they believe that he's got his back and they got their, he's got their back. And, you know, the things that he did with the Black Lives Matter march a year ago and, and the things like that, that means a lot to these players. So, you know, as long as you got your, you know, your players bought in like that, you have a chance to be very successful. Right. And, you know, just briefly, like there's a storyline that came out last week that got a lot of national attention involving Lincoln Riley, involving the Chandler Morris transfer and not releasing him um, and things like that. And I feel like 
well, Lincoln Riley got a lot of flack for that. And we saw a similar situation with, I'm blanking on the name, but he uh, went, to, Kendall. Went, yeah, went to West Virginia. And there was a similar kind of situation there. Eventually, Riley let him out. What is kind of the tone surrounding that situation? And just in terms of people who cover the team, how do you guys feel about this whole drama that the media is kind of blowing up about it? You know, I haven't explored it much, to be honest. Like, it's not something in my job. It's not a question that I would ever ask Lincoln Riley. But, you know, I know from coaches even outside of football that have expressed, um, you know, not being able to transfer in conference. Like, it's not just football that has this issue. They just are the ones that are the the big headline getters, right? But there's other coaches, other programs, and not even just here at Oklahoma that do not want athletes to transfer in conference. And and I think if you, you know, in my opinion, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. And again, I haven't really explored it much because that's not my duty. But, um, you know, if you start opening up the door to, you know, a free for all, who knows what that's going to make college athletics look like. And I don't know. I mean, again, there's pros and cons to both, but, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I fully believe that Lincoln Riley's not the only one that feels that way. I just think it's, he's the one that's getting the headlines. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, like, you know, I, I didn't, it's all good. I was just wondering, cause this, this been talked about so much. And every time I pull up something on Oklahoma, it's Lincoln Riley is a bad person because of this, or he's tone death on the transfer portal. So I just want to see what the tone was around Norman, but on a positive note, man, this signing day class was amazing. Two months ago, it wrapped up another number one class in the conference, headlined by five-star Caleb Williams, who was the best quarterback in this recruiting class. But in terms of what the needs were for the Sooners, what were the biggest positional needs, and who in this class can you see being immediate contributors? Yeah, I think what you saw out of the defensive backs, for sure, um, length. Right. And and we heard that a lot from Teddy Lehman that, you know, on signing day, the these defensive backs are long, they're tall, they're um, quick and, you know, getting getting that length to cover some of these big wide receivers in the Big 12. Uh, Dennis Simmons has said that, you know, very rarely in a recruiting class, if you, you know, get a wish list of everything of everybody you want and you need it never happens where you get everybody on your wish list and they got every single receiver that they wanted i mean you want to talk about a haul at the wide receiver position and those guys mario williams already you know doing big things out on the practice field with this team um you know billy bowman was is a guy that they are very excited about and currently i think he's playing defense but um you know could move either side. You know, he's explosive on the football field, no matter what position he's playing. Um, I think they got, you know, defensive line, just they, every, every player. And that's kind of, I guess what's crazy because they felt very good about the freshman class last year. And then you look how many people got on the field. And I think that's kind of speaks to this coaching staff and the talent that they're being able to bring in just because you know you've been around and you've been here if someone comes in and earns their spot and they're going to play you as a true freshman and um i think you know just from the few practices that i've been out of we've been able to see how competitive um practices are just again building the depth you think about if, what three years ago for the spring game there we couldn't even you know coach riley talked about we couldn't actually do a scrimmage because they didn't have enough you know depth and talent, especially in, on the defensive side of the ball. So, um, you know, the fact that they've been able to you know, bring in uh, so much talent, but then the how that raises the competition level in practice. And so I think, you know, they hit it out of the park. They got not only guys that are highly ranked and five-star, whatever you want to call it, four-star, but um, also guys that fit in this system and what they're looking to do. And, you know, the – the buy-in with the defense and and then just yesterday I had a lengthy conversation with Marvin Mims and I asked him about you know his freshman season which was a record-breaking season and um he said didn't really take any credit for it he said you know it's the scheme that 
coach Riley has in place and, and the trust they have in me. And so, and I think that's why you keep getting the top offensive talent in the country year in and year out is because they know that the, they're playing for the best offensive mind in college football and maybe even all of football right here in Norman. So, um, you know, and, and the competitiveness, you, you think like some guys, Oh, I want to come in and be the guy, but you know, they know that there's plenty to go around. And so I think a lot of those freshmen right wide receivers that they brought in, you're probably going to see get get an opportunity just like we saw last year from Marvin Mims and the year before. I mean, like Theo Weiss and Trajan Bridges and Jaden Hazelwood were a trio of five-star recruits and Austin Stogner. They were all sophomores last year. So, um, you know, I think those three guys are going to take big steps going into to this year as well. And then, um, you know, as well as these freshmen, they're going to come in, they're going to compete for playing time as well. So, I think on both sides of the ball, they hit it out of the park, and you're going to see a lot of young players again with a mix of these young players from a year ago that got a lot of experience. Right. And, you know, looking ahead here, I mean, you mentioned Marvin Mills had an outstanding freshman season, breakout player last year, but we also saw some departures. I mean, Charleston Rambo heads down to Miami and transfer Creed Humphrey to the draft, Ramondre Stevenson to the draft, Ronnie Perkins to the draft. Who are some potential breakout players for this 2021 season that we could uh, look in at the end of the season and say, man, I did not see this kid coming? Well, I think, um, first of all, the running back room looks completely different than it did a year ago. You know, Kennedy Brooks is back, and it's a thousand yard rusher that you're getting back. And then Eric Gray, the transfer from Tennessee, looks very good and um, has been getting some reps and he's going to add some much needed depth because again, you're in and you're out as we've seen um, from that running back position, you know, they, they need more than one guy. They need more than two guys. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, this offense starts in the run game. And so I think you're going to see some big things from the running back room and maybe Kennedy Brooks wouldn't necessarily be a breakout guy, but he's a guy that wasn't on the, on the field last year. So, you know, you're looking at him maybe potentially having another big season and then Eric Gray and then Seth McGowan is only going to grow even more. You know, you, you hear people talk a lot about how with freshmen a lot of times um, it's not so much that they can't run the football. It's more so how you pass protect and, and you're blocking. And that's a big learning curve going from high school to college and figuring out how to you know, protect your quarterback. And so I think, you know, Seth McGowan, Marcus Major had a huge game in the Cotton Bowl. And we've seen that he can do um, lots of things. He's, you know, might be their best pass catcher. And so, you know, I think you're going to get to see a lot of those running backs. Um, you know, I think Mikey Henderson could be a guy in which we saw flashes of last year could be a guy that, that has a breakout season as well. Um, you know, I think on the defense, it's going to be um, – you're 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 basically replacing your you know second well I guess your quarterback position uh, with both corners being gone with Trey Norwood and um and then the nickel with Buki and um uh, Trey Brown being gone but the safeties are back and Delarian Turner Yell and Patrick Fields and then you got Nick Benito back and um while Ronnie Perkins yes that that hurts but you know we saw that defense kind of doing pretty big things even without him before he even got there. The defensive line, again, the depth you talk about, a lot of those guys are back, led by Isaiah Thomas. So I think with the defense, you're you're going to see some young guys for sure. But, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that they've returned so much um, from last year as well, I think you're going to see those guys kind of even step it up. And I think you might see Nick Benito just have a monster year. Um, even though he, again, you know, had a pretty big solid year breakout year last year, I think he could even up it up a notch. So there's a few guys that I think, um, you know, you potentially could see big things from. Yeah, Eric Gray is a problem. I, I yeah. looked at him at Tennessee, and he dominated toward the end of the season. And we had um, – so I forgot um, who we had on for Tennessee. They were saying that he was probably the best player on Tennessee's team. So that's a huge pickup there. But looking ahead to the 2020 season – I think the Sooners are the favorite for the Big 12. They have some tough road games, though. That K-State game you mentioned in the past few years, they've had problems with K-State. Texas, I mean, a sneaky game against Tulane in New Orleans. That was a shocker to me when I looked at that schedule. That program has been on the upswing. They're sneaky. And Iowa State, late November. I mean, I, that could be a potential doubleheader where they'll play that week in the Big 12 title in a few weeks, too. 
What is the ceiling and or floor for you for the 2021 Oklahoma Sooners though? Yeah, it's kind of funny because a lot of people were saying last year, you better get Oklahoma in 2020 last year because you're not going to get them again for a while. And so I think, you know, again, that's what the expectation is, is to go in and win a Big 12 title. You know, they've won more consecutive Big uh, Big 12 titles. I mean, well, they've won more consecutive than anybody in the conference has won overall as a program. So, you know, that's what this team goes in to do. You don't, and, you know, I did a I did a piece on this last year going into the Big 12 championship and interviewed a few guys. And now that the streak's kind of been going and, and most, you know, most of these players have been a part of or have helped win a bit, you don't want to be the guy or the team that that streak <laughs> stops with. And that is something that they talk about. We don't want to be that team. So, you know, that's – they go into this year, in into every season – this is, you know, this it's what we do. We're the we're gonna keep being Big Twelve champions. So, um, you know, I I just think again, just the way that they were able to end the season with so many young, um, so many young guys on the field, the the growth that they were able to see, and then the talent they were able to bring in, and um, you know, I I, I think potentially this could be, um, the. I don't. I, it's hard to say because that that Baker Mayfield Rose Bowl year was a, a pretty uh, daggum good team. But if you're looking at both offense and defense, it's it's hard to argue that this might not be the best team that Lincoln Riley has had from top to bottom um, going into a season. So there's a lot of expectations in that, but it's nothing new. Like that's not a it's not a you know hot take by any means like that's what this program does they even the down quote unquote down years you go into it expecting to at least win a big 12 title and again to continue to to have your name in the national conversation but i think this year's team for sure for um fan base for you know this the players um you, nick benito said you know we got big big goals and i wanted to come back because nick benito was a guy that you know could have could have left and gone to the draft, but he said, you know, I wanted to come back and win the last one. And I think this team has the potential to do that. So that's the expectations. That's the expectations every year though. But yes, this team certainly feels like they should be competing for a national title going into this season. Uh, I think they will. I think in my preseason top 10, I had them second right behind Alabama. And just because I think previous national champion has to be number one, but Oklahoma is going to make a run. And, you know, shifting to the environment, I'm planning a trip to come down to Norman. If they're allowing a full capacity, I want to go to the Iowa State Oklahoma game. That is going to be a game because Barisi Hall is going to be back for Iowa State. It's going to be a juggernaut battle that night. But before I get there, what makes the environment of Norman Oklahoma Memorial Stadium so unique on game days? Oh, man. I mean, it's just. Um... I guess it's just the tradition of knowing, you know, when you step on that field, it's not just about that this year's team, right? I mean, just with with the history and the legacy and the tradition that comes with Oklahoma football and these players will tell you it's bigger than you. And so I think when you, you know, you see the stadium full and you walk on Owen Field and you, you, you feel that, you know, you feel that this is um, – you know, a dynasty. Um, so I think just, just overall the, again, the expectations that you, they don't lose on Owen field, you know, they just very rarely does it happen. I mean, that was the first home loss that Lincoln Riley had suffered last year against Kansas state. And, uh, you know, the Bob Stoops lost had what more conference championships than he had home losses. So, you know, just overall, you don't, they don't lose at home. It's just the, um, fans walk in there expecting a win and I, every single time and not, and very few programs, especially in the big 12 can, can say that, that, you know, they feel confident that they're going to be leaving that stadium, having just watched Oklahoma win a football game every single time they play at home. So one of the most dominant programs at home. And I just think it's just, again, the feeling of knowing that that's how it's been and that's your job. You got to go and you protect your home field. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think just overall, just the, the feeling of the tradition and the, you know, um, you know, the the pride that kind of comes along with Oklahoma football for me is is kind of what what I feel when I walk down there on that field. 
Yeah, we we talked to Chris Plank. He was actually one of our first guests that we ever had on the podcast. And the way he described it just makes me it, like I was going to go last year. Then COVID hit. I'm here at K-State. So it's a short drive. But last question here. I know you got a lot of stuff to go do. You've covered this program for a few years now. You've seen some amazing moments, players, games while covering the Sooners. What has been your most memorable moment since you've been covering the Sooners? Oh, man. Um so many to choose from, but I think probably my the favorite thing that I've ever done. I'm a basketball person. I'm a, I play basketball. Basketball is my favorite sport. Um, going to the Final Four that year with uh, Buddy and Isaiah and Brian Spangler. That run was incredible. You know, I got to work the um, team stream on TNT and just that whole season. But the run in the tournament, Buddy's uh, just show that he put on in Anaheim against uh, Oregon and, um, you know, the, the ride itself, but, um, you know, getting to experience the final four, despite the um, unfortunate outcome of the game against Villanova, that was just something I'll never forget. So I, I'd have to say that year and, um, you know, covering Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield's Heisman Trophy winning seasons were pretty incredible as well. And uh, Lauren Chamberlain's home run race. And what's special about that is now uh, Jocelyn Allo is is um, going to be right on their heels uh, before the season's all said and done. So I just think just overall the athletes that have come through Oklahoma for multiple sports, you're looking at some of the best um that have not only worn the Oklahoma uniform, but, you know, that have been the best in, in their respective sports. So, um, but if I had to choose one, it would have to be the the final four year with, with Buddy senior year. Yeah, that, uh, that's that's got to be – I mean, that tops my list because, I mean, I got to go to the final four and see Auburn a few years ago. We had an equally bad outcome when we went to, <laughs> so we can relate on that. Um, and I kind of have a little bit of disdain for Oklahoma. I'm not going to lie. Y'all <laughs> took our softball championship away. We finally make it as Auburn. We never have one. And then, you know, y'all just outpitch us. The pitching staff that they put together in that softball team is just unbelievable. But, man, I appreciate you joining me. I know you were so busy, and this was an absolute blast to talk Oklahoma football. But where can our listeners find you on social media, Any of the, uh, all the countless shows and podcasts you do? Where can they find you? So I'm pretty easy to find because there's not many Jessica Cooties. It's just at Jessica <laughs> Cootie basically on everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm uh, next. Well, every week I'm on uh, Sooner Sports Spotlight, but I'll be on the call for the spring game this year coming up um, on April 24th, which should be fun uh, with Toby, uh, Toby Roland and Dusty Dvorak. So um, get to do that again. And I feel like things are kind of starting to get back to normal a little bit. I mean, obviously um, still – very much you wear masks and, you know, social distance and whatnot, but I kind of can feel like things are getting a little bit back to normal. And I think people are pretty excited about this spring game, you know, getting to, to see this football team in action again. So I think it should be a pretty fun spring game. So excited about that. Again, that's April 24th. And I think tickets just went on sale um, for that. And yeah, um, I just, my interviews, a lot of the times are on Plank's podcast, on Sooner Sports podcast, and I've got features coming out. I got a, a cool one that I'm working on with Jocelyn Allo. Um, speaking of her, that will come out next week. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I stay uh, stay pretty busy. So, but if you stay locked on to Sooner Sports TV on social media platforms and uh, the Oklahoma social media platforms, you'll be able to find me. <laughs> That's awesome. But guys, make sure to go follow everything Jessica does. Oklahoma is going to be a program you're going to want to follow year in and year out. I know y'all already do because they're always in the national spotlight, but y'all know where to find us. This, you know, ends our third episode for our Big 12 and 30 Days. We got awesome episodes lined up next week. But guys, for Jessica, for myself and the Blue Bloods, we are out.